when one of my children was younger, they got into a pattern of stealing money from me, taking my debit card and, and uh, puffing up um, any of the errands I sent them and spending it on something they wanted. It didn't get atrociously outrageous, but it was enough that I started to notice. And I, I called my child on it at one point, and, and they denied and denied and denied. And then finally, when I had... Um, uh, evidence that they could not dispute. They finally confessed that they had been doing this. And then I asked them, what do you think we should do about this as a consequence? And of course, they were a child. So all of these huge punishments that they could come up with that basically treated them like a, a disturbing little individual who wasn't worthy of any kind of redemption or grace or kindness. All of this is very typical of children who have very little power in their lives. And I remember my child that very day that we had worked out all of this and I, I hadn't assigned a, a punishment at all. I needed another errand run for me. So I gave them my, my bank card and told them to go do it. And they stood there staring at my bank card and said, you trust me? I did. There, there was no consequences to have. It was a lesson learned. To the best of my knowledge, that child has never stolen anything from me since, and nor have they done anything like that with anybody else. There was a need there that needed to get tended to, acknowledged, not punished, not destroyed for it. I remember that story when we look at this, story, this chapter, uh, this last chapter in the Gospel of John. Because there's a lot of question marks, there's a lot of, a, a lot of incongruencies that come up with this story of Peter, and it is about redemption. It's about Jesus telling Peter that there's more expected of him. Now, looking at the 21st verse of John, there's a, there's a lot of additional conversations that we could bring in. The fact that it's tapped on to the end of a gospel that was complete, we can look at the end of verse 20. It was complete. It was done. So somewhere in the middle of the second century, they decided they needed to slap on this additional chapter of, of Peter. Now, it's very, very evident that this is all about rehabilitating Peter, making him significant, making him the focus, because the gospel of John doesn't do that. The Gospel of John is about the beloved disciple, which very, very early in Christian tradition was identified with, um, uh, with John, the, the brother of James, who was one of the early apostles. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that doesn't make sense, not the least of which is, is the language and the timeline that this Gospel was written. Because if we go with the assumption that this was written about John, the compatriot of Jesus, well, he's probably dead long before we get to the gospel being written in the turn of the first into the second century. So timing aside doesn't really work. But besides that, if we push aside patriarchy and we push aside the assumption that men were the only ones doing the writing at that time or the teaching, which we've got evidence otherwise, there is actually a, a small body of scholarship that to suggest that Mary Magdalene was, in fact, the beloved disciple, and that, that this came out of the school that she supported and, and where her um, understanding of Jesus' ministry uh, was teaching. So whether that is or not, the, the fact of the matter is there's a gospel complete and then this tack on at the end, which takes our attention away from the fact that John 1 to 20 is a complete thing. So let's look at 21. What is, what is actually in there in this first part of 21? Well, it's, it's the going out to fish. It's another example of the apostles not recognizing Jesus as he appears to them. That's, that's pretty typical of all resurrection narratives, that Jesus is not recognized in the beginning, and then through his actions, they see who he is. So we got that going on. And then we have this encounter with Peter. Now, Peter is, well, first of all, he's not my favorite apostle, but he is the brash one, the thoughtless one. He is, he is the one, and it's consistent across all four Gospels, so they were not making this guy up. He was the one who wanted to jump head first into being right, and he messed up all the time. I mean, if we need a really good paradigm of how to screw up the Christian message, all we have to do is look at Peter. He did it every single time. He 
gets himself in over his head, and Jesus has to bail him out every time. Well, what we see in John 21 is really the last time Jesus is physically there to do that for Peter. So he sits him down, and it's very symbolic that it's across a fire. Because remember, in our passion narrative, it is across a fire that Peter denies Jesus three times. And now we have Jesus asking Peter three times whether he loves him. They're meant to offset each other. As much as Peter did not step up when the chips were down, he is now trying to step up. It's, it's, a, it's a chapter full of, of fixing his character, fixing who he is, hopefully getting a little bit of maturity in Peter. It's also heavily influenced by early church tradition that said Peter was the originator of the, um, of the Christian communities in Rome, which we have, there's absolutely zero archaeological evidence and zero biblical evidence to support that. So that's just legend. That's myth of, of our tradition. There is nothing historic about that. But people needed Peter to be rehabilitated, and they used this chapter to do it. So Jesus asks, do you love me? Then take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Lead my sheep. Now, the sheep metaphor is always a, a very pressing one in the Christian scriptures, because this is a land where sheep and goat herds were everywhere. People understood the concept of taking care of sheep. They weren't the smartest animals in the world. They weren't the necessarily the best behaved. But there was a relationship between the sheep and the shepherd where the sheep could be absolutely guaranteed to count on the shepherd to provide for their basics. And this was a Peter was being asked to do for the growing Christian community in Jerusalem. Take care of them. Make sure their basic needs are met. Now, going back to Peter, the, the, the reckless individual who's always barging in without thinking and not figuring out the consequences, here was Jesus asking him to do something simple, profoundly important, but simple. It's a fantastic metaphor for our church. All too often, People think when they're part of a church community leadership that it's got to be big and it's got to be brassy. No one wants the mundane jobs. No one wants the little jobs that need to be done just to keep everything going. Or if we do have people who want to do that, they don't see themselves as being that important. They're just doing the job that needs to be done. I've done ministry from one side of this country to the other, and in every province I've ever lived, every province I've ever preached in, there's always that person, usually a woman, who is just taking care of things behind the scenes, doing the things that need to be done just to keep the church life moving. That's all Jesus is asking Peter to do. Peter's not being asked to found a church. Remember, Jesus asked him to look after his sheep. Jesus is asking him to look after, metaphorically, the people who are already there. Not necessarily the people who are going to come following, but they'll be folded in, of course. But to look after what is already present. No heroics, no grand statements, no standing up to the authorities. Just take care of the basics. Get in there and make sure the sheep are fed. They've got water, they've got protection, they've got care. And yeah, sometimes the shepherds got into horrible situations with wild animals, authorities, robbers, whatever. But generally speaking, it was a very quiet life. It was on the outskirts of most of society. It was not being the focus. Jesus was asking Peter to put his ego aside and just do what needed to be done for the community. Now, whether Peter put it together that when he was challenged by Jesus, he always came up with this answer of assuredness, and then he was challenged by someone else, he always denied Jesus, we have no idea. Don't know if the early church came up with that either. But here is a story of hope that the person who screwed up in a big way repeatedly still gets another opportunity to help the ministry 
of Jesus, to bring people to an understanding of the richness of the world that Jesus was creating for us, to help articulate and identify the Christ in us as we move forward as a community. Not with fanfare, but with simple little things that needed to be done for our continued development. If we look at this as a method of ministry, more people can see themselves as contributing to the success, if you want to look at it that way, the growth, the, the richness, the, the wonderfulness of our Christian communities. Peter is not the founder of the church in Rome, but Peter is the one who is asked to do the basics to keep the whole group moving, the whole community moving. We need to find that in ourselves. We need to find that in our community and celebrate that even the person who screws up is given a very special kind of ministry. And Jesus commissions us and calls us to recognize that and to live it.